These words, O oh Lord, reflect our hearts when we contemplate ourselves, when we think about who we are, what we bring to the table before you. We count it all as rubbish that we may have Christ. And so we sing the song as those who recognize our desperate neediness and have come to you our only help, our only hope. We ask even now as we sit before your word this morning that we would be comforted, encouraged, challenged, changed in all the ways that you intend by the power of your Holy Spirit through the instrumentality of what you have said, how you have disclosed your own heart, your own mind, your own love towards us. And we ask for help in these things for your glory. Amen. You may be seated. I just want to express on all of our behalf uh, gratitude for these servants who have just led us so well this morning. Uh, they do a lot with a little. Uh, they have busy lives and ministries and family and work, and they get here early on Sunday mornings for the first rehearsal of the songs we enjoy, just so you know a little bit behind the scenes uh, how much they labor and then come together, and God orchestrates it all and leads us so well. I was moved um, a week ago uh, at hearing a recording that uh, mistakenly perhaps um, picked up the wrong microphones, the microphones that pick up your voices, <laughs> and just got to listen to a recording of you sing on a Sunday morning. It's just remarkable. Um, I love that we gather together corporately to reflect on who God is and mutually encourage one another. And you need to know the instrumentalists up here see themselves as instrumentalists and service, servants, but they know that you are the worship team. God's the audience. We worship Him together. And it is just marvelous to hear one another's voices. I want to give you a prayer uh, request answered update um, or soon to be answered. Uh, the Mitchells, uh, will be on their way to my Roro uh, sometime between this service and our evening service. And so after much prayer, much longing, um, much planning, and a whole lot of travel, uh, they will finally be there in the village. So continue to pray for Ryan and Elna, Sebastian and Callista, as they step back into the village with the Doe people who have recently heard the gospel in its clarity, and some of whom have recently believed. Uh, we can continue to pray for that fledgling church. This morning, I want to turn your attention to a psalm, a song, uh, Psalm 121 in your Bibles. Omri read this last week in our public reading of Scripture, and I want to turn our attention to this psalm in detail this morning. I'm amazed at how much help there is out there. There is a ceaseless train of self-help books. There are endless tips on social media for repairs, remedies, recipes, and we bounce from help to help to help. Where do you turn for help in life? Instagram, Google, a friend. I want to turn our attention this morning to a song. This song is Help for Life. It's one of the songs of ascents. Uh, it's literally a song of the steps. Those are the first words in the Hebrew text. And this is the second in a collection of 15 songs, Psalm 120 to 134, that are collected together as the songs of the steps. They were sung by pilgrims on their journey to Jerusalem for the three mandatory festivals a year. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 lists those feasts as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. And then later on, these songs in their collection were sung by worshipers as they ascended the Temple Mount. They went up the staircase, and there are 15 steps. It coincides with these 15 songs, and you would stand on one step and sing one song and move to the next step. And we want to unfold this psalm in a couple of parts, let's read it together. We're going to see the psalmist's personal reflection, and then he'll turn the corner to public instruction. 
Let's read this together. Psalm 121, a song of ascents. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Yahweh is your keeper. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. Yahweh will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Yahweh will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. The songwriter here reminds the faithful in two steps that we have no help but Yahweh. We have no help but Yahweh. That's what this song is all about. This is theology for life. Not some sort of ivory tower abstract contemplation of things, but a true knowledge of the true God and that true knowledge leading to real help in real life. Let's look at his personal reflection first. These are the first two verses of the song. He writes, A Song of Ascents. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth. This is a Q&A, a question and answer, and the songwriter is speaking to himself. And he's reflecting on truth by asking a question and then answering it. The question is this, I'll lift up my eyes to the mountains, some versions say the hills, where shall my help come from? The pilgrim coming to the feast would be approaching Jerusalem. He would be approaching the house of Yahweh where Yahweh's special presence abided and where his people gathered for worship. So is the lifting my eyes to the mountains then a reference to Mount Zion, the, the prominent mountain in the mountains around Jerusalem, a reference perhaps to God's very dwelling place? I'm lifting up my eyes to Jerusalem, to the temple. Some have thought that the lifting up my eyes to the hills is a, as I'm approaching Jerusalem, the hills surrounding are full of dangers. There are bandits and robbers, marauders and enemy armies. And so as I'm approaching Jerusalem, I'm looking up to the hills. Where does my help come from? Or thirdly, the possibility here is a reference to the high places, the mountains and the hills, the high places of idolatry. You read your Old Testament, you hear this refrain, on every high hill and under, under every green tree, Israel sacrificed to the pagan nations of the land. From Dan to Beersheba, from north to south, the people of Israel had given themselves to idolatry. They were supposed to eradicate the land of the false gods. But the false gods instead were worshipped on every elevated space from north to south. Israel was a cornucopia of options, offering a smorgasbord of helps for financial prosperity, family fertility, rain for crops, protection from enemies, healing from diseases, a license to party, and participation in perverse pleasures. That is what the high places were in Israel. And I believe the reference in verse 1 is to those high places. And notice the contrast in verse 2. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from Yahweh. He doesn't say my help comes from the mount, from Jerusalem, or the, the beloved name for Jerusalem, for Zion. No, this is a contrast. It, the psalmist encourages us to look beyond the mountains, to the one who made the mountains. Look down at the next psalm of ascent, Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. We read that this morning. Not to the high places, not to the hills, not to the mountains, but to the house of the Lord. Now look down at Psalm 123, verse 1. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Where should our eyes go? This contrast is critical. Not to the various helps that the world offers, but to God alone. Listen to the Old Testament's descriptions of the high places. Deuteronomy 12.2, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods. 
on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. 1 Kings 3, the people were still sacrificing on the high places because there was no house built for the name of Yahweh until those days. Now Solomon loved Yahweh, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, those high places of idolatry. Listen to Jeremiah 3.23 in this invective. Surely the hills are a deception, a tumult on the mountains. Surely in Yahweh our God is the salvation of Israel. There's the contrast again. Now let's look at this contrast in verse 2. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth. This single theological truth ought to put an end to all other searching for help. How quick we are to seek help anywhere other than God, as if going to God for help was our last resort. How we ought to run to Him as first resort in everything and for everything. He is the maker of heaven and earth. That is, He's the maker of the universe and everything it contains. And do you remember how God made it all? Out of nothing. This is is power. This is power limited only by His perfections, His purpose, His goodness. Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us that His eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen being understood from what? From what has been made. Listen, there's an incentive here for us to study creation, to study creation as worshipers of the Creator to note God's creativity and His power and the sustaining of His creation in the variety and the beauty and the magnificence of all of it, in the grandeur of it, in the size, we ought to get a sense of our place on the scale of the universe. In the macro, go out as big and as far as you can, down to the micro. By the way, if you, if you look at orders of magnitude in magnification, from the size of a human out to the biggest things that exist and the size of the universe. Those orders of magnification are smaller than the orders of magnification required to go down to the finite and small the other direction. In other words, known particles are smaller compared to us than the whole universe is big compared to us. God is the maker of all of these things. Why would we go anywhere else for help? Anything in the created order can't compare to such power. By the way, to compromise on a biblical view of creation is to compromise right where we need help. The maker of heaven and earth is uniquely suited to meet our needs. No one else qualifies. Listen to Isaiah 40, 28 and 29. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Jeremiah 10 says similarly, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It is He who made the earth by His power, who established the world by His wisdom, and by His understanding He has stretched out the heavens. When He utters His voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and He causes the clouds to ascend from the end of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings out the wind from His storehouses. Every man is stupid, devoid of knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his molten images are deceitful. There's no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of mockery. In the time of their punishment, they will perish. The portion of Jacob is not like these, for the maker of all is he, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. Yahweh of armies is his name. When heaven and earth go away, he will remain. Before heaven and earth were created, he is the helps that Israel sought when they spurned their maker, where are they now? Where are the armies of Egypt and Assyria and Babylon? Where are the religions of Baal and Chemosh and Asherah? The fickle fads of human helps will all go away. 
Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth, remains forever. And with infinite resources and the kind of power that brought everything out of nothing. In verse 3, the songwriter changes from personal reflection to public instruction. He's going to teach us now. Notice the shift, the shift in pronouns. Verses 1 and 2, it's I and my. From verse 3 to the end of the psalm, it's you and your. He is moving from his own experience to our encouragement. He's saying, taste and see, Yahweh is good. I've tasted, now you taste. And he is speaking here to believers, to the faithful. The promises that are on display in this song are not universal promises to all of humanity. These are promises to God's beloved on the earth, the saints, His people. Now, we need to make sure we understand this. These are promises for those who are rightly related to Yahweh in faith, who have submitted their lives to Him and who look to Him. And notice the transition from Yahweh as creator in verses 1 and 2 to Yahweh as keeper in 3 to 8. And we move here from unlimited power to personal care. This is not power for power's sake. This is not power held in reserve just in case of something. This is power to help. This is Yahweh's unique competency employed for timely benefit. And the rest of this sermon will focus on the songwriter's public instruction. Here's his instruction. Yahweh powerfully, carefully, personally keeps. He keeps. He keeps you stable. He keeps his people. He keeps you strong. He keeps you safe. He keeps you from evil. He keeps your soul. He keeps your travels. And he keeps you forever. The key word in this section is to keep. Six times in these Verses Three times Yahweh is, said, is called the keeper as sort of a, a title. And the last three times the verb form occurs, Yahweh actually keeps. To keep here is to guard, to watch, to stand guard, to watch attentively. It's a very common word in the Old Testament. Adam was to guard or keep the garden in Genesis 2.15. Shepherds are said to keep sheep. A guard was said to keep silver and the storehouses of treasure and food and goods. What's, what kind of keeping is this? This is intentional, present, personal, strong, reliable keeping. And the public instruction that follows here in verses 3 to 8 requires a response from us. Uh, this is not a mere novelty, something to observe and move on. This asks of us faith, dependence, prayer. Those expressions in our life where we actively depend on the God who is dependable, where we actively look to Him as He longs to supply our needs. It also requires of us a rejection of idolatry, a rejection of self-sufficiency, a rejection of practical atheism. You know what practical atheism is. It's where you say, I believe in God, but you live as if you don't. All these things must be rejected. And perhaps one quick thought about the structure as verses 3 to 8 unfold. There is a stair-step structure in the grammar here. One word in one phrase is picked up by the same word in the next phrase, and we're building from there. It's like we get onto one step of theological truth, pick up on that idea, and move up to the next step. We are ascending the steps of the practical application of theology. What we know to be true about God is here foisted on our day-to-day experience. Our faith is to be restrengthened. Our focus is to be recalibrated. And so you can imagine why pilgrims making their way to Jerusalem for corporate worship would be singing a song like this. Why worshipers would stop on the second step in the staircase to sing this second song of the steps. Who is the songwriter's help? Yahweh, maker of heaven and earth. Who should be our help? Only Yahweh. Let's receive this public instruction. Yahweh powerfully, carefully, personally, first of all, keeps. Keeps you stable. Look at verse 3. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Literally here in Hebrew, he will not give your foot to the slip. (laughs) 
The things to trip on and trip over and slip on and slide down are everywhere in this world. The idea of steps is the idea of your walk of life. And what's so remarkable about the step here, it's not the picture of a freeway, but one foot in front of the other, each individual step, the singular step, he will not give your foot to the slip here. And who is it that won't give your foot to the slip? Back to verse 2, it's Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. The one who holds all power, the one who made everything out of nothing, is the one committed to detailed personal care in your life. Not letting your foot to slip is about stability in your walk of life. Every step is overseen by the personal care of God. You are not left to fate or to chance or to blind circumstance. It's easy to slip and to slide and to trip and to fall. And weak as we are, we are prone to slip. Imagine the perils we would endure if left to ourselves and there were no sovereign personal care. What trouble would we get into? What trouble would we make? And when does God do this? Notice the second half of verse 3. All the time, (laughs) he who keeps you will not slumber. What a remarkable promise. He takes no breaks. He takes no naps. There is no rest for him. It doesn't matter when you walk. Yahweh is present. He is powerful, and he is personally caring for his beloved. Have you ever experienced help that was too little or too late or just wrong? Maybe you've walked into the hardware store and asked for advice, bought the wrong pipes, installed them, and then flooded your bathroom. Maybe that was just me. (laughs) Too little help. You bring a pocket knife to a gunfight. Help too late. You know, if only Sam Houston's armies could have arrived in time, the Alamo and its 150 defenders would not have been lost. And Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie might still be with us today. Maybe you received misguided help. I've driven to some of your homes using Siri and Google Maps, and I ended up in a dirt lot in Santan Valley or the back alley of a strip mall in Gilbert. Maybe you get worse than misguided help, but dangerously wrong. You put water on a grease fire and burn down the house. Look, the maker of heaven and earth When he sets his affections on someone, he ensures that all will be for their good. His help is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never wrong. Next, we see Yahweh keeps his people, verse 4. He keeps his people. And this is the one that's sort of uh, out of sync with the rest of this public instruction. It's all you, 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 you. But here in verse 4, it's, and Yahweh keeps his people. This one's not about you, individual. This is about the collective of the people God has invested in. Yahweh is the protector of his people, the shepherd, the guardian, the keeper of his people. This was true of Israel in the Old Testament. This is true of his church now. And listen, he has not forgotten Israel. Do you remember our dive into Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 6? The Lord has not forsaken his people Israel. Even if we Gentiles are from a funny olive tree, uncultivated outside of the garden, grafted into the rich root of the olive tree, which is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the household of Israel, we are grafted in by grace, and God has a plan to restore Israel according to His promises and keep every one of these promises. He does not go back on His promises. He does not forsake. He keeps His people. And he keeps his people Israel at the national, even generational level. There is a day coming when all Israel will believe the gospel. Notice the constancy of his help here in verse 4. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. We're taking that step. He he doesn't sleep when you're taking your steps. We move up to the next step in the staircase. And this one who never slumbers or sleeps keeps his people collectively. Collectively. Think about this, that Yahweh never sleeps or slumbers. Dangers can be awake at any hour, and you and I need to sleep. Bad guys can wait until we're not ready. Armies can sneak up in the dark, but God never sleeps. I had a security job one year. 
at night trying to study Hebrew verb paradigms while staying awake. Confession, I nodded off a time or two. What if the worst had happened in those moments and the guard is sleeping? Yahweh never sleeps. He never slumbers. And this is a, this is a low blow to the idols in the high places. The fertility cults were worshipped in the seasons where people needed things to grow. But in the off-season, the gods were dormant. They were sleeping. They were away. Listen to what Elijah says on Mount Carmel when he's challenging the worship of the false gods in comparison with the one true God, Yahweh of Israel, 1 Kings 18, 27, Elijah mocked them and said, call out with a loud voice, for he is a God. Either he's occupied or gone aside or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. Yahweh never sleeps, doesn't need to sleep. This is critical theology here. Yahweh, as maker of heavens and earth, is independent of his creation. He, he transcends the universe. He is self-existent. Every other existence is derivative. We exist because he says so. But God alone self-exists. He has no need of self-preservation efforts. He needs no food. He needs no drink. He needs no rest. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't need vacation. He has no other business to attend to than to his perfect purposes which include the preservation of his godly ones on the earth. If he is awake, you can sleep soundly. There's no sense both of us staying up all night. If danger's awake and Yahweh's awake, I can go to bed. You can rest in him. Next, Yahweh keeps you strong, verse 5. Yahweh is your keeper. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. Notice in verse 5, we've moved from the collective back to the individual. That's so interesting, thinking about Yahweh's care. Yeah, Yahweh cares for Israel. Yahweh also cares for the individual Israelite who has set his faith on him. Yahweh loves his church. And Yahweh loves you, believer, personally. We're back to the individual here. And notice what is said. You don't get lost in the crowd. This is personal, individual care, and it is shade. That is, protection from scorching Middle Eastern sun. I read Spurgeon's commentaries on this verse, and he said, you know, it's, it, sometimes you get too much of a blessing. <laughs> well, Spurgeon was an Englishman. All he knew was rain and gray and cold skies and damp walls. Sun sounded great. Too much sun. How's that possible? It leaked out into his commentary. But you live here. <laughs> You run your air conditioning in November. You wear hats and sunscreen, and if you go to the Middle East, people are covered up. You're thinking it's 124 degrees in the Arab Emirates. Why is that guy wearing clothes head to toe? Well, if you lived there, you would too, to be covered up from the scorching heat. What is this idea of shade? Listen to Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That is a comfort. We talk about throwing shade. That's negative. That's a criticism. God casting shade was a comfort and a protection against the danger at daytime. And what is protected here in verse 5? Your right hand. This is a Hebrew way to speak of power or strength. This is a promise from God for the sustaining of strength needed to endure life's hardships. Listen, there's a clue here for where this psalm is going. We're not free from trouble but we are promised here strength in trouble. Look at the next one in verse 6. God keeps you safe. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. Commentators have had uh, you know, relative ease understanding being smote by the sun. Smitten? Smited? But what does it mean to be smited by the moon? Uh, moonstruck. You know, we have our English word lunatic from the idea that those who spent too much time uh, late at night not sleeping when they're supposed to out in the moon rays went a little crazy. I think what's involved here is not some sort of uh, moon fever, but this is simply an expansion from verse 5. Your protection, your safety, the keeping of your strength extends past sundown. 
This is a song, this is poetry, so there is a, a parallel here with an economy of words. Sun and moon is a way to say day and night. It is a way to say 24-7 care from Yahweh all the time. At what hours will Yahweh keep me? All hours. This is a statement of safety. With Yahweh, you are safe. With known dangers and unknown dangers, in the heat and the cold, in the day or the night, amidst enemies seen and unseen, you can trust Him. Next, Yahweh keeps you from evil. Yahweh keeps you from evil. Look at verse 7. Yahweh will protect you from all evil. New American Standard, the word protect here, it's still the word keep in the Hebrew. It should be translated keep so that you see it where it appears. He will keep you from all evil. Evil here is simply a bad. It's a bad. Uh, sometimes the word evil describes moral perversity, sin. Uh, sometimes the same word for evil just describes a physical calamity. Uh, you can, with the word evil here, describe a sin or a tornado, an immoral person or a landslide that buries a whole village. You can describe with this word a failure to love God with all your heart and soul, mind, and strength, a failure to love your neighbor, or a toothache. And there's tension here for us, isn't there? Who read this verse? Yahweh will keep you from all evil. What does this mean? Is this a failed promise in the Bible? Is this a promise that Yahweh actually will keep us from all bad? Yes, it is a promise that Yahweh will keep His precious ones from all bad. And you who have endured evils of various sorts, sins and toothaches, recognize there's a tension here. There's a clue to understanding this tension in the second half of the verse. Yahweh will keep you from all evil. He will keep your, do you see it there? Soul. The inner man. The real you. Not a promise there to keep your body or all your teeth. But He will keep you. Do you understand who you are? You, you are your inner person. The thinking, reasoning, feeling, emoting, willing you that transcends this bodily existence. And you were meant to be in a body. You will one day have a glorified body that is fit for eternity. But the real you, the nephesh here, the soul, is what Yahweh promises to keep. And we'll develop this a little more in a moment. Sometimes, many times... In fact, probably many more times than we are aware, God actually prevents bad things from happening to us. We can think of the times that bad things did happen to us, and we are tempted to ask the question, God, where were you? Your promises are no good, or I don't have enough faith, or all the silly, unbiblical, bad theology things we might think in that moment. We don't often contemplate all the bad things that God didn't bring into our lives, allow into our lives, let us trip over. It's helpful for us to be grateful to remember that many times God actually fulfills this temporally in ways we don't know. But I want to give you two ways in which this promise is fulfilled for those who are rightly related to Yahweh. And before we do that, let's just talk for a moment about what it means to be rightly related to Yahweh, what it means to know Him, to fear Him, to live in a right relationship with Him, what it means to have faith. That is to hear God's words and believe them, and, and particularly to enter into relationship with Yahweh, you must hear God's words about you and believe them. My friend, frankly, that you are the problem. That your sin before a holy God, Isaiah 59, has separated you from God. And it's not that God's arm is so short that He can't help you or His ear is so dull that He can't hear you, but your sins have made a separation. There is only one solution to the problem that is you and the problem that is me. 
And that solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yahweh in the flesh who came to the earth to live amongst us, to be misunderstood, maligned, eventually murdered by us. And he didn't die as a victim, unaware of what would happen to him. No, he said, I came to lay down my life as a ransom for many. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. How would Jesus, Yahweh in the flesh, save that which was lost? By giving his life in our place. He went to the cross on purpose. He endured the wrath of his father against every sin that would ever be committed by every one of his precious ones, past, present, and future, in order to bring us to God. He made peace with his father over our crimes by his blood. And friends, there is no other way to have a right relationship to God. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. If you don't know Yahweh through Jesus Christ, you are helpless. Our only help comes from him. And we only know him through his son, Jesus So let me give you these two ways in which this promise, Yahweh is your keeper, Yahweh will protect you from all evil. How is this absolutely fulfilled as a promise from God? Number one, this will be fulfilled absolutely in the eternal state for all who are loved by God through Jesus Christ. Sins forgiven means you are qualified to dwell in His presence and listen to what it is like in His presence. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. No more bads. (laughs) This promise will absolutely be fulfilled. This is true for every Israelite joined to Yahweh by faith. This is true for every believer today through Jesus Christ. There's a second way in which this promise is fulfilled, a temporal way in which this promise is fulfilled for God's people. Listen to this. God takes the bad out of the bads. God de-evils the evil. This is so important for us to understand. This theology is so critical. Believers get toothaches. Unbelievers get toothaches. But God is doing something for the believer that he is not doing for the unbeliever. You remember Genesis 50, 20? You've memorized it. Joseph said of his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. What did God do with the bads that Joseph's brothers brought into his life? Lied to dad, pretended he was dead, put him in a hole, wanted to kill him, sold him into slavery. Those are bad. Bad things happened to Joseph. What was Joseph convinced of when he had opportunity for revenge? Theology applied to life. God superintending human events so that what you meant for evil... God meant it, same verb, same it, for good. If we need that truth. Romans 8, 28, similarly, God works together all things for good to those who love him. What's in that basket of all things? Bads, toothaches and tornadoes and sins of people against us. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose, all things for good. What else is God doing? Psalm 119, 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. God is up to something good in my afflictions. My afflictions are bads. <laughs> what does it mean that God's going to keep me from all bads? No more afflictions. Oh, he's going to keep me from the bad in the bads. He's producing something, a, a longing for him, an, a, a, an affection for him, obedience to him, a keeping of his word. Hebrews 12, similarly, those who are disciplined of the Lord are loved by a father. It's the evidence that you belong to him. 
is God taking difficult things in your life and refining you. These are goods. Believers get refinement, joy, hope, Christ-likeness, maturity from difficulty. You can write down James 1, Romans 5, 3, and 1 Peter 1, 6. James 1, Romans 5, 3, 1 Peter 1, 6. That whole list of goods are produced by difficulty. And all of this is in the present. This is not a waiting for the by and by fulfillment of this promise. Unbelievers do not get these things from trials. They only get difficulty and afterwards judgment. Can you, have you thought lately about what it's like to live as an unbeliever, to experience the same difficulties that God graciously brings into your life without the gracious part of it? Just life is hard and it stinks and, and it's just terrible. And you try to ameliorate the bads with uh, forgetting about them, drinking yourself into oblivion, find some recreation to distract yourself from them, but in the end, you will be always brought back to the hamster wheel of life under the sun, under the curse. And then there's death. And what's after death for those who have not turned to God? Only condemnation. Unbelievers do not get these good things from trials. They only get the difficulty. That's the here and now side of the promise for difficulty for us. The, the future side of the promise, there will be no bads, but there's more to it than that. It is what Keith Green called in his song, Trials Turned to Gold, that the difficulties for us in this life, good that they are in God's good hand, producing for us more Christ-likeness, refinement, dependence upon Him, joy, eternal perspective, usefulness. More than that, trials produce for us what Paul calls in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, an eternal weight of glory, an eternal glorious weight Something so weighty, so significant, so glorious that Paul in that same sentence is willing to call affliction light and momentary. And when you've been afflicted, those are the last two words you apply to your affliction. Right? The last time I had a cold, I did not call it light and momentary. I've forgotten it now. Cancer is not light and momentary. Trials under the difficulty of a hard relationship are not light and momentary. Persecution is not light and momentary. Mistreatment is not light and momentary. Physical agony is not light and momentary. And yet it is called that in view of an eternal perspective. It is thrown off the scales. It shouldn't even be compared to the weight of glory. In fact, that's exactly what Paul says in Romans 8, 17. That the glory that is to be revealed in us is not worthy to be compared with the tribulations we now face. You shouldn't even put them in the same sentence. And so the, the difficulties in this life for the believer are being used not only to refine us in the here and now, but are being given by God as a gift in that which produces a greater weight of glory to come. Such that when we see it then and experience it then, we will never say, well, I had a hard life, but this outweighs it. <laughs> I had a what? Can you believe where I am? Evil, bad, all of it is a slave to God. Evil bends its knee to Yahweh. Evil confesses with the tongue the lordship of Yahweh. Evil must therefore be made a servant at God's beck and call unto the good of his beloved on earth. How do you know you're loved by God? When God turns your enemies into your dearest friends because they are used in his good hand to refine you and to store up treasures for you in heaven. Evil doesn't win. Bads don't win the day. God is God. He is our help. Second half of verse 7, Yahweh keeps your soul. He keeps your soul. 
Whatever we lose in a trial, we will one day be grateful for. God, did you shave that off of my life? Whew, thank you. It's hard to say in the moment, isn't it? That we will see one day with better vision. We will know that what God kindly, surgically removed was not good for us. Our dross is refined. That which is fit for eternity remains. God keeps your soul. Again, not a promise to keep your body. Your body's not fit for eternity anyway. Nothing that God intends for our good can be snatched away by circumstance, hardship, trial, difficulty, enemies, disease, sickness, or even death. Yahweh will keep your soul. Listen, when difficulty knocks on your door, you can be assured, believer, that it is good in the hands of your keeper. And by contrast, when good things from God knock on the doors of unbelievers, they receive them. Ungrateful to God, believing perhaps that they deserve them or are owed them, they worship the created thing rather than the creator, and they go to eternal judgment with God's good gifts condemning them all the way. Everyone needs God's soul-keeping care. Only believers are promised it. Verse 8, God keeps your travels. God keeps your travels. Yahweh will guard your going out and your coming in. Very briefly, this is your comings and your goings. It's the totality of your business of life, going out of your house for work and returning. It's going out from the temple in Jerusalem, out of the gates of the city to your home and your farm, and then returning through those gates again to worship Yahweh with His people. Could you imagine being the pilgrim and thinking about these songs? Uh, this, in fact, was the favorite psalm of David Ling Livingstone. It was his travel song as he contemplated penetrating the continent of Africa as an explorer and a gospel herald. God keeps your coming in and your going out in, in all of your doings on this life. Think about God keeping your coming into the world and your going out of the world. Yahweh is your keeper through and through in all of life. And then the last part of verse 8, the last public instruction, Yahweh keeps you forever. From this time forth and forever. Literally, the Hebrew reads, from now and until the forever. And you know, I, I think I'm drawn to that forever. Yeah, Yahweh's going to keep me forever and ever. And I had skipped over the now part. Right now, Yahweh's promise is to keep you. And that never ends. It's not just a future reality, a present reality. When earthly help fails, and it will, let that failure be a reminder by contrast of where your help comes from. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Yahweh who made the heavens and the earth. And he keeps, and he keeps, and he keeps It's a great gift from Him when we are stripped of self-sufficiency, when our vain hopes of lesser helps are uprooted. Charles Spurgeon said, none are so safe as those whom God keeps, and none are so much in danger as the self-secure. Let's pray together. Should we lift up our eyes, O God, to the mountains, to the hills, to the high places, to all the offerings of this world? Where would our help come from? Our help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. You will not allow our foot to slip. You keep us and you will not slumber. You keep Israel and you keep your church. And you will neither slumber nor sleep. You are our keeper, our shade on our right hand. The sun will not smite us by day nor the moon by night. Yahweh, you will protect us from all evil. You will keep our souls. You will guard our goings in and comings out from this time forth and forever. May we rehearse this song of the steps. What a joy it is to gather together, give collective testimony to your character and your care, to experience mutual encouragement. And may we live our short lives fully trusting you.